So what I want to give you now is what's called the Biosava law. So uh, let's write down what is Biosava. So what this law is going to do, it's going to tell us what is the magnetic field that is set up when a current flows. So, um, what magnetic field is set up when a current flows? So that's the what the is going to tell us, and uh, we'll state it for a little segment of wire. There's our little segment of wire. It has got a length, dL. So, I, so, so this wire continues on. I'm just looking at a small piece, dL, of this piece of wire. And um, there's a current, I flowing. And you know what that current is. It will be lambda, the charge per unit length times the velocity. And what I would like to know is, what is the magnetic field at this point over here? So what is B sitting here? Okay. So we want the B field here. And uh, we're not sure what it is. But that's the place that we want it. So what Leo Savart tells us is the following. Let's write DB. This is a small magnetic field because we've got a tiny piece of the wire. So dB will be equal to mu naught. This is just like 1 over epsilon naught for the electric field. So this tells you what medium you're in. And if you're in different media, you'll need different mu naughts. Does anybody have an idea? What do you think mu naught is telling you? inside a region. Actually, 1 over mu naught tells you that. But that's a great guess. That's what I would have guessed. So 1 over mu naught tells you how difficult it is to change the magnetic field flowing in a region. If you wanted to prove that, what would you try to derive? Great. The energy that would be stored in the magnetic field. Very good. Yep. Let's see. Maybe we'll actually do that together. Uh, so we've got mu naught. The field is spreading out. Tell me the next factor. Uh, because now this distance is coming up, we know with the electric fields we have uh, positive and negative charges. Uh, we don't have the magnetic uh, monopole, let's say, positive charge. And uh, we also know that from Coulomb's law that charges that uh, force act along the line, joining the centers of the two point charges. So from there we can reduce the direction of the, of the, of the electric field. Now, in this case, like, you know, we are having that with um, then, um, the L. In what direction will our field points? Um, okay, good. So, so I will write down the answer for you, okay? And I'm, I'm going to tell you this is what they measured in experiments. So you might find that unsatisfying. If you're not satisfied with that explanation, then I, I'm going to invite you just to hold on. And next Friday, Tsaga will give you a much better explanation of the direction of the magnetic field. Okay? She'll derive it. Okay. I'm just saying it. But Zaga will derive it. <laughs> Good. So the direction of the magnetic field is going to puzzle us. But right now I'm asking, the field spreads out in three dimensions. How do you expect it to fall off with R? 1 over 4 pi? R squared. Everyone happy with that? Good. Yes, that is how the field falls off. Now the point you were worried about, what's the direction? Well, 
Here it is. You take the direction of the current. You take the cross product with R hat and you multiply by dl. So what is R hat? <coughs> R hat is this unit vector. That's the direction of R hat. So from the source, R hat points to the magnetic field. Okay? So now, let's get some practice again with the cross product. Here's our segment of the wire. There it is. That's dl. The current is flowing in that direction. The point that we're measuring in the magnetic field is over here. Would you guys please tell me which direction is b? Out of the board? Careful. It's got to be perpendicular to that, perpendicular to this. Good. Absolutely. So if it's perpendicular to this and to this direction, it's either up or down. So now you've got a 50-50 shot. <laughs> ah, good. So let's do that together, just to make sure. First finger is the I, right? We want I cross R hat. So there's I. That's where R hat points. Where's my thumb pointing? Up. So that's where B will point. Good. So that's the direction of DB. Perfect. And you know, I think this looks pretty intuitive, that this combination appears. Not the direction. The direction, well, is not easy to understand. But you could imagine if you take dl and you double it, well then you have twice as much current, twice as many charges moving in there. So if you double dl, you would expect the field to double. And that's why the dl appears. If you double the amount of current flowing, then again, there's twice as many charge carriers, you'd expect the magnetic field to double. So not surprising that I appears and DL appears. That's not surprising. Okay? Isn't the vector on zero? Isn't the vector on? Okay, so, okay, good question. Is that how you've usually seen it written? Is okay, so. It's on, it's either I, DL, DL is on the direction. So. Some people don't like to give the direction on the current. They like to give the direction on DL. Okay? What their convention is, the piece of wire always points in the same direction as the current. So I is always parallel to DL. And then they will pull the I out and write DL vector there. Okay? So it's, you know what? If you take 10 different human beings and you ask them all to write down a physical law, You'll get 10 different looking equations with 10 sets of e conventions. Okay? And uh, that's just another convention. Can I convert you to my convention? Yeah. Good. Okay. So we'll stick with this one. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> now I, I want to write down. So we've got the magnetic field for a piece of wire. If we wanted to get the total magnetic field, we would take this result and. In, exactly. Integrate over the piece of wire. Okay? So we could do that. Okay? We are going to do that for one case. It's, uh, in general, it can become quite uh, difficult to do the integral. So again, we'll develop something else. But what I would like to do is, I don't want to write down this answer for the piece of wire. I want to write it down for one charge. And I want to remind you of what we did yesterday when we wanted to work out what was the force acting on a single, on a piece of a current carrying wire, knowing the force that acted on a single charged particle. So I want to remind you of that argument, and then I want you to try to argue what's the magnetic field acting uh, due to a single moving particle. So yesterday we said, F was equal to, what's the, the force on a single charged particle? Q, V, Cross B. Good. And then we said, well, if we want the force on a current carrying wire, okay, so we might have some wire in a magnetic field B. We said, let's pick a little piece of the wire. And inside that little piece of the wire, there will be a charge DQ. So we said, DF will be 
V cross B multiplied by DQ. And then we said, well, if this little piece of wire has got a length of DL, we can write DQ as V cross B times by the charge per unit length times by the little length of wire. But then we said lambda times by V is the current. So we said that this is actually nothing but I cross B DL. And then we said to get the total force, we just integrate. And, and here we're using the superposition principle. Take the force acting on each uh, particle or piece of the wire, add that up, and now you get the total force. So we've gone from a formula for a single particle to a formula for a current carrying wire. Now here we wrote B L sub R for a piece of current carrying wire. Can you guys manage to work out how do we get the magnetic field for a single moving charged particle? So I want to know what is B for one particle that's moving along. Is it clear what the question is or should I say it again? Say it again. Good. <coughs> Here we, we started with the formula for the force acting on a single charged particle. Knowing the formula for the force on a single charged particle, we were able to write down the force for a current carrying wire. Here I gave you the field from a current carrying wire. I want the field from a single charged particle. So here I went from single particle to current carrying wire. Here I want you to go from current carrying wire to single particle. I, I is lambda I is V lambda. Very good. That's the key. So let's put that down. So this can be written as mu naught 1 over 4 pi r squared the current is lambda v cross r hat dl now let's let's really get it clear in our minds why is that the important step when we talk about the current flowing what's the current a property of this huge number of particles the current when we talk about the current we talk about many particles flowing when we talk about the velocity, what are we talking about? One particle flowing. So in this step, we've gone from the variable that describes our whole collection of charged particles going along. And in this step, we're starting to write things in terms of single particle variables. So that's the key step. And it was the key step here too, to get it in terms of the current. Okay? Good. So, great start, Ishmael. What next? Take the lambda out. Great. Perfect. Lambda dl. What is lambda dl? That's the dq. Great. So now we've got the of up for a single particle. Let's just write it down. For a single particle, B is equal to mu naught 1 over 4 pi r squared V cross r hat and exactly the charge. Great. That's B of so for a single particle. So if you have one particle moving along, that's the magnetic field that it will set up. Okay. Can somebody remind me what did Newton's third law say? 
So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Good. How important is that law? Does it have to be respected? Yes? Sorry? So, so, so I'm saying, let's say that I say to you, oh, let's just forget about Newton's third law. Is there something horrible that would go wrong in physics? What? What, what horrible thing would go wrong? So maybe many horrible things would go wrong. That might be true. But can you point to one statement that we really wouldn't like to give up, that we lose? Conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum. Good. Does anybody know why Newton's third law implies the conservation of momentum? Is there anybody that would like me to run through that? Okay, let's run through that quickly. Very good. So Newton's third law is related to something deep, the conservation of momentum. And we don't want to give that up. Good. So we know that if we have, let's say we have got two particles interacting, we have got M1 and uh, it has some acceleration, D2, X1, DT2. Let's just work in one dimension, okay? So we've got these two particles interacting. The one exerts a force, the other exerts a force, and these we know are equal and opposite. So I'm going to summarize it by saying M times the acceleration of particle 1 is equal to F and M2 times the acceleration of particle 2 should be equal to minus F. There's the action, there's the reaction, right? But this I can write as D by DT of M1 times by dx1 dt. This is M1 times the velocity of particle 1. What is that? Momentum of particle 1. And for this case, we can write d by dt of M2 dx2 dt. That's the momentum of particle 2. So what this is telling me is, if I take d by dt, of the momentum of particle 1, that's F. And I add to that d by dt of the momentum of particle 2, that's minus F. And F minus F is? Zero. zero. So because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, momentum is conserved. So momentum had better be conserved, right? Good. Now that we know the magnetic field set up by particles, let's study two charged particles moving and let's calculate what force does particle 1 exert on particle 2. We immediately know that particle 2 must exert an equal and opposite force on particle 1. Okay? Let's check that. Um, good. <coughs> Okay, I'll uh, clean over here. Here is our first particle moving with a velocity v1. It has a charge q1. Here is our second particle moving with a velocity v2 and a charge q2. So um, what we know first of all is if we use Coulomb's law, what will be the electrical force between the two? q1, q2, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, r squared. Let's put in r. Okay? And we know for Coulomb's law that um, 
If Q1 is positive and Q2 is positive, the two will repel. So good. Those two forces are equal but opposite. Okay? So that's R. Okay, now, I would like to know, let's work out the force that uh, particle 1 exerts on particle 2. So let's work out the magnetic force that 1 exerts on 2. So, we know what that is, okay? We need to take Q2, uh, V2, cross B, and let me write du2, 1. So that's the magnetic field that particle 1 sets up at the position of particle 2. How will we calculate that B field? We'll use B O sub R for a point particle. Okay? So can you guys please tell me in what direction does that B field point? Okay, good. You're doing the right stuff. <laughs> First finger in the direction of? V1. Good. So I'm pointing in that direction. Is that correct? Second one is R hat. Now I want to look at the magnetic field here. So R hat points from the particle to the place where I'm calculating the field. So R hat points down. Don't worry, that's gravity. So there's R hat, there's V. Which way is B? Into the board. Great. So into the board. So B2, B due to 1 will be into the board. Great. So the electrical forces will be equal and opposite. We've got one of the magnetic forces. Let's calculate the second magnetic force. So for the second magnetic force, we need to calculate. Okay, you guys tell me, what do we need to calculate? Q1, V1 cross B due to 2. Good. Can someone tell me in which direction is B due to 2? Out. Out? Okay, let's see. Which way is V? V is up. Which way is R hat? Up. What's the... Okay, let's see. Which way is V? <laughs> Up. Which way is R hat? Where is our origin? <laughs> so, uh, okay, our origin is over here. No, I mean on the diagram. We... There. <laughs> if we make the origin, so R hat points from the particle to the place where you want to measure the field. In particular, it doesn't depend on the origin. I meant this because for the first particle, we have already taken our own on this. Well, you see, for the first particle, there it is, and where's the magnetic field there? So R hat points down, you agree? Yes. That's where the second particle is. Where do we want to calculate the field? There. So which way is R hat? Up. Okay, which way is V? Up. Which way did you guys say the cross product was? What? the cross product for two parallel vectors? Zero. What? So what's B due to two? Zero. So what size is this force? Zero. And this one we said is not zero. Is Newton's third law true? Is Newton's third law true, guys? 
No, it's not. Newton's third law is not correct. Sorry. <laughs> and here we've seen it. If you look at these two particles, this particle does exert a magnetic force on that particle. This particle does not exert a magnetic force on that particle. The electrical force is equal and opposite. So sorry, Newton's third law, out the window, it's wrong. Okay? Are you guys happy to accept that? <laughs> no. Okay. I can detect some resistance. Okay. So what we're going to do now is, okay, we're going to try to see how big is this problem. So which force doesn't obey Newton's third law? That one. Which force does obey Newton's third law? Coulomb's force. So let's try to work out how big is this force compared to the Coulomb force. And let's see if we can get some idea how big is the problem. Okay? Let's see. So, let's try to do that calculation now. Uh, so, the first thing that I want to do is, I want to calculate the magnitude of this. So, I want the mod of Q2, I want V2 cross B. Now, you told me B was into the board, okay? And we know that V2 is like that. So what's the angle between V2 and B? 90. Mod of A cross B is mod A, mod B, sine theta. Theta is 90. What's the sine of 90? 1. So in fact, this will be Q2, let's assume it's positive, V2, the mod of V2, times by B, the mod of B. Okay. Now let's work out what is the mod of B. So we can get the mod of B from this formula. So uh, let me maybe just put it above. So B will be mu naught. Q1, because it's particle 1 that's setting up the field, over 4 pi r squared mod of v cross r hat. v is in that direction, r hat is in that direction. What's the angle between v and r hat? 90. So the mod of v cross r hat will be mod of v, mod of r hat, which is 1, sine of 90, which is 1. So this will be the mod of v1. So if we now plug in the mod of B, we get mu naught, uh, Q1, Q2, V1, V2 over 4 pi r squared. So this term doesn't obey Newton 3. Spoils Newton. Three. The term that obeys Newton 3 is the Coulomb law. What's the force, uh, what's the, the electrical interaction? 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q1, Q2 and there is an R squared. This is the piece that obeys Newton 3. The base Newton's third law. So now let's just calculate the ratio of the two. term that spoils Newton 
3 over mod of the term that, let's say, respects Newton 3 is equal to. So we've got mu naught of the 4 pi v1, v2, q1, q2 over r squared divided by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1, q2 over r squared. Well, that cancels with that. And um, we can now write this as this is equal to v1, v2 over 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times by, and let's write 4 pi over mu naught. The reason why I'm keeping those two factors separate is that we know that 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is 9 times 10 to the 9. And can anybody r remind me what was mu naught over 4 pi? Does anyone remember that number? This is an easier one to remember than that one. Because you don't have to remember the number up front. It's just 10 to the minus 7. Okay? So what's 4 pi over mu naught? 10 to the? 7. Plus 7. So what's the product of those two numbers? This is v1, v2 over 9 times 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 7 is? 9 times 10 to the? 16. That's interesting. I can write this as v1, v2 over, oh, 16, good, 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. What's 3 times 10 to the 8? Speed of light. So this is actually v1, v2 over the speed of light squared. If the speed of light was infinite, this would have been naught. This is the first sign that you are seeing, okay, that Maxwell's equations don't work when you put them together with Newton's equations. Newton's equations need to be modified. Classical mechanics needs to be modified. And the theory that you get when you modify classical mechanics is special relativity. Special relativity is not the same as classical mechanics. It's a new version of classical mechanics where uh, you, you, you have Lorentz and Darius. Now, Newton's third law doesn't hold. Does that mean that momentum is not conserved? No. But, but you see, if we modify Newton's laws, don't we modify the conservation of momentum? You see, Newton's third law was saying nothing but momentum is conserved. Those two equations are equivalent. In fact, momentum is still conserved. But there's a new contribution to momentum. Remember when we were saying what is the energy stored in an electric field? And we got one, we got epsilon naught over two E dot E. The field doesn't only have an energy, it also has a momentum. And you can work out what is the momentum in the field. And the momentum in the field is related to E cross R. If you work out the momentum of both particles plus the momentum of the field, that is conserved. So the conservation of momentum is the deep thing here. That remains true, even though Newton's third law doesn't remain true. Okay? I think this illustrates something. So for the mathematicians here, I think that you will like to hear this. Um, <clears throat> when the mathematicians prove a result, it's here forever. Pythagoras' theorem is still true. It's a fact. As a physicist, when you prove a law, you know at some point in the future, people will understand that your law is wrong. Just like Newton 3 is wrong. But, uh, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know? Newton's laws hold well if you want to build a bridge, or a motor car, or an aeroplane. 
But if you start to work at speeds which are large or, or, or some fraction of the speed of light, then you need to change the laws. So all of our different laws of physics have some domains where we can apply them, but when you go outside of those domains, you go too small, too fast, too much energy, then you have to change the laws that we have. Not so bad. Okay, okay guys, let's stretch our legs and we'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs>